I got very, very angry and I could feel my heartbeat rising and I kind of, uh, I went into my car and I called my family and broke down crying and I didn't know what to do or what to say and because at this point something very big and central to my life was going to change. This is a disease that is so rare that I never heard of. It didn't cross my mind that I was going blind. I immediately thought of, well, how am I going to learn? How am I going to be a friend? How am I going to work? How am I going to be a spouse or a father? And it was quite jarring and scary. I couldn't really explain the symptoms to anybody well. I would try to explain to my dad, I can't see at night. And he would go, what do you mean? And I said, I just, I, I don't see anything. I think it's hard for someone else to really comprehend what that means. I have about one to maybe five degrees of vision. That's kind of hard to communicate to someone else without a metric. With Eitan's degeneration, what, you know, what he has in his, are his photoreceptors, his rods and his cones are starting to, to de degenerate, but the output cells still remain intact, and it makes him a candidate for this as, you know, for people with macular degeneration and retinitis pigmentosa, because they all fall into the same category of they start to lose their, their the receivers, the photoreceptors, the receivers of light. So if you don't have any light coming in, you can't see. When a person gets a retinal degenerative disease, what happens is, is that the photoreceptors, is the input cells, die. And over time, the cells that are connected to them, they start to degenerate. But one thing that you have reliably left are the output cells. They're called ganglion cells. They're the cells that form the optic nerve, and they're the ones that send signals to the brain. So our strategy is to, in general, with prosthetic devices, is to jump over all the damaged area and go right to those output cells so they can go back to sending their normal signals to the brain. And the problem in the past has been that you can activate those cells, but you, you can't send their, the signals to the brain that the brain is expecting. So the brain's a complicated thing, and it's, it, it needs to receive the signals in a certain language, in a certain code. And so my claim to fame is cracking that code so I can take images, can convert them into that, those same patterns of pulses that the retina would normally send to the brain. And so the idea is that the brain would understand it. So if the brain is expecting to, you know, speak in, in French, I'm, I'm speaking French to it instead of just speaking English and, and it can't understand it. So I'm speaking to the brain in a language that it can understand. People think of the eye as being like a camera and that the retina is just the film in the back, but it's not true. It's actually a, a complicated image processing device. And so when I'm saying that cracking the code, what I mean is I figured out the transformation from images to the pattern of electrical pulses that come out of the retina. And people had done it before for figuring out very simple images like stripes, but they didn't have the code for, you know, essentially every kind of image. And so I generalized it so that for any image, I know the pattern of output. Like in this case, we show, we're showing a football game. So it's what the football game looks like when it's in the form of neural code. Um, and so when the brain receives this pattern of images here, it's what your brain would be seeing if you were watching TV and, and watching a football game. Of course, once you've figured out that you have this, it occurred to me that I could use this as a way of making an artificial retina for um, helping blind people see. And so once I realized that, you know, I jumped out of my chair and I've been just doing that kind of madly um, ever since. It was just fundamentally wanting to understand how this works and then realizing that if I did, it became my responsibility to, to bring it to patients because who would walk away from, from that potential opportunity to be able to help people with your own knowledge? There's nothing I can do was not something that I ever want to hear, but um, was particularly 
unsettling. So to have people so committed means a lot. These doctors and not just their efforts and, and their attitudes, but uh, their commitment it gives me a sense of, I, I trust what they're doing. It's very general and silly to say, oh, science is progressing and we'll get to treatments one day. It's another thing to meet the people that are waking up every morning and thinking about this stuff every day. So that, that is something that feels like it's taking a certain level of power back. Having the code is, is only half the story. The other part is having some way to communicate that code into the cells so that they can send it to the brain. So I call it an encoder and a transducer. Where we are now is we have a device and there's a part in which we have to get the device to interact with a tissue. And so we have to inject something into the patient's eye and we have to get permission from the FDA to do this. And then the person will get a pair of glasses, like ski goggles, that has the electronics. And so it has a camera and then it converts the camera into this code, these, these pulses and then the pulses interact with that compound that we put into the eye to send the signals up to the brain. So it's like a handshake between the device and the thing that we put it into the patient's eye. I definitely miss being in the driver's seat and in the summer having my hand out the window as music's playing with one hand on the, on the steering wheel and going too fast. I also don't like to have to ask my younger sisters to chauffeur me around, but and this is the reality of my life. One thing that's interesting about it is that there's a potential to enhance it. So we could also include like ultraviolet light or infrared light. So we could make blind people actually have better vision in some ways than, than we do. And I like the idea that, you know, if you've been blind and so you're always on the side of being the challenged person, that now you'd be the bionic person. So now you'd have all these extra advantages. You could see things that, that regular people couldn't see. It seems fair. What we do is we're really, it, it's independent of how it happened. We're just, we're saying, okay, if you if you're, have advanced stage blindness, regardless of how it happened, we'll try to restore your sight. Well, at first I was very intimidated, to say the least, by the idea of going blind and still not something that I particularly welcome. It's not something that I'm afraid of. Probably thousands of people have written to me, and this is a big issue, is, you know, to be able to see their daughter's face, to be able for wife to see her husband's face after all this time and watching it watching the vision get worse and worse and worse and to be able to give that back the ability to see to see your spouse or to see your child to give that back I can't you know I mean there's nothing that could be more gratifying than that Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.